All right, it's 6.01. We have a quorum. We have everyone but Lisa, John, and Geetha. And Geetha said she might not be on until later anyways. So at 6.01, we can get started. Um, so we'll call to order. And Andrew, are you watching for public comment? Sure thing. No. And is anyone weighing in? Anyone have any hands raised? No, no hands yet. So we'll go right into uh, meeting minutes for uh, 216, which is a redo, and 228. Has everyone had a chance to review those comments to John? Yes. Can we get a motion to approve? Yeah, they, they look good to me. So those were, th that was some addition from Gita expressing some of her concerns around, Correct. you know, borings on the soils and, and so forth. So she had submitted some recommendations for those. There's a little paragraph that's been added. Look good to me. Right. I'm happy to move to approve as amended. Okay. Second. Second. Colleen. Okay. John's on. All right, we'll do a roll call. Just make it John on there. All right, uh, Mark. Aye. Aye. Chris, Colleen, Frank. Aye. John. There's two Johns. John Miller's here. Okay, John. You're last on the list, John. I'm going in the order of the screen. <laughs> All right, Chris. Uh, okay, John Miller. Here. Uh, you in favor of the? Yes. Uh, okay. Todd? Aye. And Brian? Aye. All right. All in favor. Thank you. Moving on. Winchester High School. This is some new business from Meg is going to explain, I guess, Meg, or uh, introduce it. We need some funds to... Uh, fund some design work to be done to be put out to bid you want me to can i can i give the background real quick jay sure yep okay so um this is chris so at winchester high school um i was made aware over the summer that we have some bathrooms i think it's nine bathrooms in total with no uh period product dispensers in the bathrooms uh, which of course we need to address um separately some of the students have approached the administration and school committee about providing those uh, free, um, which is also something that's been discussed on Beacon Hill here for the past couple of years. Most likely that'll become state law anyway. It's the right thing to do. So um, Meg and Pete and I were at the high school last week scoping out some of the bathrooms. And uh, what we would like to do is just recognizing this as an oversight of the project, use project funds, um, authorize Meg, to go get a, a proposal from an architect to basically look at those nine bathrooms, produce a set of uh, key plans, elevations, figure out what devices need to be specified so that it could be installed as early as this summer. Um, so the request is not, not for the construction and installation, but just for the design package, authorizing some monies for design. Um, and that's the speech. So I don't know if Meg has anything else she wants to, to offer. Not really, no. Um, so I will, if if you, the committee votes it, I will move forward and get a price from uh, either Tape or Plansburg. Those are typically the two architects we usually work with, and then we'll uh, move forward into getting uh, the equipment ordered and installed. You know, the will you be able to do it this summer. Right. Do you have a price in mind that we could do a not to exceed to help you move along quicker, or? Uh, I would say not to exceed, why don't we say 5500 right now for uh, engineering or design, and then we'll, we can move into the request for uh, the installation once we know what we think it will cost and what the time frame might be. Right, at least that will move it along a little bit quicker. And Frank, Frank, Frank of course, is 100% in support. I'm speaking for him. As I said, Mr. Nixon, I am completely support, and it's good to be able to get this thing going. I've been kind of hanging out there for a while. Can we get a motion? Okay. John, hey, I, have, yeah, I just have a move. question. For, I have a question for Okay, it. John Miller, yes. Couldn't, couldn't we just hire a vendor, Meg, to, to go do this? I mean, why, why, why go through a designer and, and wait till the summer? Chris, do you want to answer that? 
Yeah, I'd love to. So, John, when, when we have vendors go into our buildings and slap stuff on walls, we wind up with ADA violations. And when Chris and Pete and I and Meg were looking at the bathrooms last week, we still have some. So, you know, vend vendors will provide you the hardware for free so long as you get into a long-time service contract with them. And what we really want to do is be sure we're providing the right thing that we need. Um, and so in some cases, John, the walls are very tight. Like we have um, ADA access routes to the accessible stall. And so we're hoping that most of these could be surface mounted, but some may have to be semi-recessed. And so each one is just sort of a unique condition. I, I, if, we, if everything's been designed and we still have ADA violations, this, the, <laughs> that kind of undercuts the argument that we need an architect. But John, I, I get it. John, John, you and I should have a long cup of coffee one night, and I can tell you a story. But uh, I, I don't, I don't disagree with where you're coming from. We have some issues at the high school. Some of them are construction issues. Some are design issues. But I think it's good to sort of get a clean break and and get some. For, first of all, it's not like we paid to have them installed and they weren't. They just weren't installed, and I, I don't believe we ever paid to have them installed. So we just need to fix it and get it right and get it done. Just seems like an extra extra step than extra money. But and the money is coming from the high school fund, right, Meg? Correct. So I'd, I'd move to authorize Meg to um, uh, get proposals from architects not to exceed $5,500 for designs and specs for uh, period product dispensers in the bathrooms at Winchester High School to be funded from uh, high school project remaining funds. Second. Second, Mark. Free, did you get that okay? Just want to make sure. All right. All right. Roll call. Come down, John. John Sully. <laughs> Sorry. All right. Um, Frank. Aye. Colleen. Aye. Chris. Uh, John Miller. Uh, aye. Todd? Aye. And Brian? Aye. Okay, thank you. All right, motion passed. Um, new business at the high school. Chris, that's you. Do um, you actually have anything? What did we well, that, that was off? it. That was really the only new item. All right, we had that as old with Meg. So, okay, so both are taken care of. Thank you. Uh, moving into the Lynch will be Charlie with the MSBA PR, PSR filing and then the status update. Um, <clears throat> the PSR has been submitted um, and the hard copy will be, if it hasn't already been, I didn't confirm today, I presume will be the hard copy will be delivered to the MSBA, a copy will be delivered to Meg, and um, that is um, complete. They've confirmed receipt. They had one comment back on needing a different format for the local actions, which the town will take care of. We presume at some juncture in the next six months, we will get comments back from them, which we will respond to as we did with the PDP. So that process will um, continue. And then uh, in addition, we have uh, a facilities assessment subcommittee meeting, which we think is at the end of March. Um, and that will be kind of a synopsis of the PSR for the MSBA and the opportunity for them to, to ask questions and comment. So that's where we are with PSR. So it's another big milestone. Thank you. Jay, can I ask a quick question? Yes. Have we, have, it, have we had any feedback, Vivian or Andy, from them on the FAS date? Did they bite when we told them we were hoping it was the 30th or whenever at the end of the month? I did speak to them and they had no issues with making it the 30th. I did indicate to them that the district had several conflicts Good. for the fifth, 16th date and the 30th would be preferred. Great. Thank you for doing that. Oh, you're welcome. All right. Um, next will be open items for MSBA and that's from Vivian. Do you want to take that? We have anything open that we have to worry about? 
For the open items for the MSBA, as Charlie just alluded, it was the local action and just for it to be a format on MSBA on the town's um, cover letter, as well as making sure that the individuals needed, I believe, Jay, you're one of them, and Frank, and... Um, no, that got changed today. I think it's, Karen, it's, the, yeah, it's the school okay. committee chair, Frank, and Beth. So okay. we'll get that on school department letterhead and get everybody to sign it. Excellent. Yeah. Great. All right. Um, Schematic design, next step in the project timeline. That would be you again, Charlie. Okay, so let me see if I can share my screen. See if I'm competent enough to do that. Can anybody see that? Yes. Yes. Okay. yes. Um, so here is um, tonight's um, graphic package. The second slide is an incredibly high level <laughs> summary of the schedule of schematic design. I didn't want to get into it in great detail. There are obviously many facets to it, but fundamentally schematic design is about um, really developing the design to the point where we can get an estimate that we're really quite confident about because you will, as you know, from doing the high school most recently, you're going to enter into an FAS agreement with them, which really is going to be the number. So the goal of the schematic design process is really to get to that estimate. Uh, and so we'll be developing the design much more um, holistically and much more comprehensively over the course of the next six months. But we really, for Mar March, uh, we're not going to do too much. Um, we're going to, we're talking about swing space. Obviously that's an ongoing conversation around sort of project logistics, but we're going to wait for the FAS meeting before we do much. And then uh, the, the, after the FAS meeting, they will um, give the, the, the go sign to have the board consider it at the end of April. So we don't really start schematic design until May, but we think there's some things that we can do during, uh, during April, for instance, I think it would be really smart to begin some regulatory meetings with some town agencies, make sure they're on board, start to talk to the environmental people, uh, to the public safety, those kind of boards. And there's not a lot of risk in doing that. And I think we may decide that it makes sense to begin programming meetings with Frank and Frank's um, staff so that we can get a head start on really getting a lot more feedback around uh, from the users. And, and um, so that's, those are things we could really do before we get the, the go sign and the go from the MSBA, which is 427. I also think we could begin to engage with utilities about incentive programs and begin that sort of sustainability process. Um, although I think we'll wait a little while before we do that as well. And then, in, and then we really begin in earnest with schematic design in May. And we want to be in a place where we can release uh, a cost estimate package to our estimators. And there'll be two estimates done, one by uh, Hill's estimator, one by our estimator. We'll hopefully get that out sort of, you know, sometime later in July uh, and get it back sometime later in August. Um, we will prepare another package for the MSBA, which includes uh, not only drawings and, and outline specifications, but a um, series of other uh, kind of documents, you know, updated lead scorecard and the like. Uh, and then we will make a final submission at the end of August. And then um, they don't actually go to the PF to the to the to the um, project funding agreement till late in October. We have it as 1026. Uh, and then, then Winchester would have a town meeting, I think, in November. And then you would have a, 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 a ballot vote at some point to be established, which my sense was that was December or January. So that's the really high level summary of where we're going with schematic design. Does anybody have any questions? Sorry, one question about the schedule for the MSBA board approval in October. It has to be on their agenda in September. Is that that's correct? right? So we have to submit by the. I think we. I can't remember what the date is. It the, the first day in September, the last day in August, something like that. We have to. We have to make that submission date in order to be on their agenda for October. Okay, so that green dash line is actually that is the hard stop limit 
that is hard stuff. To them in October. Okay, thank you. I just wanted to make sure that that limit was there on the schedule. So yep. great. Anything else? Any other questions? We have a busy summer. Yeah. But we have a lot, you know, we have more time. This feels luxurious compared to the PDP and the PSR, honestly. <laughs> so <laughs> feeling a lot better about this schedule than I was about the first two phases. We have we have considerably more time to get this right. Yeah, the beginning portion of the schedule was a little bit more condensed. Uh, that's it for that. Jay, you're on mute. Still on mute. Jay? All right, sorry about that. Uh, thank you. Uh, so you're going to move on to the site plan foundations and borings. You had some sketches. Yes, on the so there Chris is a hand raise. Oh, Chris has a. Yeah. Yeah, Chris no, has I, a I just wanted to say a quick thank you and acknowledge something. And I, some of you have heard me say this before, but maybe not everyone. This project went on hold during the eligibility phase, um, November of 20 until about the first week of January of 21 when we de de determined the MSBA was using bad housing data, we were far apart on what this building was gonna be. And so we're, we were appreciative that they were willing to work with us and get it right. But the way it works with the MSBA is you don't just lose the time you lose, but you basically get out of line. And so they take all these other districts behind you and then you, they, they fit you in when they have a place. So we have really been trying to claw back schedule uh, really since January of 21. So I just wanna say thank you to Tap A and the Hill team and everybody on the EFPBC for all these frequent meetings because it's it's been really a lot of work to kind of get caught up and I feel like we have. So um, I just want to say thank you to everybody. Uh, and speaking of meetings, um, there will be we will not have to have weekly meetings here for a couple of months, I don't think, because as I said, we're going we're not going on complete hiatus, but we're certainly going to slow down in terms of activities. So. Um, I think that the meeting schedule will become a little bit lighter um, and a little less uh, intense. Thank you. Um, yeah, so the next slide was the question about where were the borings on a actual site survey relative to the proposed building footprint. So this um, slide is just indicating where, so there were seven borings taken. Um, actually, there's six borings taken. Um, and there were a number of test pits. So the test pits are the blue squares, the borings are the red circles. Uh, two of the test pits were taken to the south side of the Lynch. Four of the test, uh, excuse me, four of the borings were taken on the north side of the Lynch. The, the uh, test pits were equally distributed. Um, three of the borings land either right on or within the footprint of the proposed N5 preferred option. Um, and so, so the and and the outcome of all these borings so far has been very little concern about soils. That obviously there are you know some there's limited fill layer. There's some organics. All of that obviously gets stripped as part of the project as it does customarily in all construction projects. Um, as we move forward, either in schematic design or design development. Um, we will do another round, a, a whole other round of borings that are much more focused on the preferred option um, and, and get even more data on, um, on, on geotechnical conditions. But to date, there are no concerns. And, and we do have some reasonable coverage on all portions of the footprint um, from, from B3 and B2 and B1. Um, and of course, during the PSR, we were, we're, not in, we're not in a position on any school project to um, focus in on one option because we had nine options. So all you do is a general characterization of the entire site. And really the point of it is, uh, is not to get into detailed design, is to make sure that the site is suitable for a school building, which we have every confidence um, it is. And that's really the exercise in the PSR, the way the MSBA sets up their process. So anyway, that's that um, that kind of uh, clarification on where we were with borings relative to the preferred option. Okay. Do you have any other drawings, or is that it? Well, I have um, I have uh, I have some some um, slides on uh, on swing space. 
is there any discussion on this before we move on then? Chris, do you still have your hand up? Sorry about that. I'll figure out how to put it down. Okay. Thank you. Anyone have any questions on the borings before we move on to the swing space? All right, Charlie, I guess you can move on. So swing space. So we just wanted to bring a little bit more um, detail to this meeting. This is a follow-up from the discussion a week ago. So this again is the Parkhurst. The Parkhurst is on the left. The Parkhurst is on the right. <laughs> the Parkhurst on the left is the preferred option, option A, which would be that we find a new home for central administration and that we're able to place uh, two or more grades um, of students into the Parkhurst itself. Uh, and that would, um, that would allow us to really just maintain the site the way it is, maintain play the way it is. Option B um, um, considers uh, eight modular classrooms, which would be two grades. And this, the premise of option B is that the district administration doesn't go anywhere and that the three pre-K classrooms in the lower level don't go anywhere and that we add eight we add two grades um, at the Parkhurst. And as you can see from this diagram, we, and we talked about this last week, we end up on um, the roadway, we end up on top of the play area, um, which are somewhat challenging. So um, we have about 30 spaces now, we'd go down to about 22 spaces available in this scenario. So, so really the question is, well, how, what, would, what would the scope be around this modular project if we needed to do this modular project? And I think the reality is it would be very difficult to consider more than eight classrooms at this site. I just don't know that I would accommodate it. Um, but the next slide shows you what could happen. We would have to reconfigure the parking lot and based on discussions with the district, we're thinking we need a supplemental parking lot of about 20 spaces maybe because this has to accommodate ongoing district administration operations, as well as um, four grades, excuse me, two, uh, forgive me, two grades uh, of students plus some pre-K students at the site all simultaneously. So we would be relocating the play structure um, to get out of the way of the, of the modulars we would be reconfiguring the uh, parking lot. We would be creating um, a new parking lot that would then be removed at the end. Um, so it'd be sitting on top of the outfield of the softball field. And then it, after uh, its use, after the modular is removed, the parking lot would also be removed. Uh, and presumably the, this parking lot would probably be restored to pre modular condition as well, because you'd want to have those extra spaces and the adequate uh, swing here for buses. This red hatch just sort of shows where that hill is. So you're not putting anything on the hill. So the burning lot would be up above. We'd have to figure out a way to get an accessible walkway down. Not sure exactly how that works, but you know, some sort of a zigzaggy thing. Um, and uh, we would uh, have to, there's a existing fuel storage that's not a fuel tank that's not being used that can be removed off site because they have gas. Um, there's utility poles that have to be relocated. Um, so, but this just gives you kind of a sense of the scope. So we just wanted to share that with you because, because part of the conversation has been, well, there are these two choices, what happens? And the fact is with one, one of them, um, we kind of leave Parkhurst the way it is and occupy it. The other, we add classrooms to it and, and maintain um, district administration there as well. So that's really... Um, that's really um, uh, the two choices that were talked about a week ago. And we just thought it was worth having a little more detail around them. Um, Frank, you have your hand up. Yeah, just to clarify, Charlie, there are actually four pre-K sections at Parkhurst now, not, not oh, three. Oh, sorry, three. I don't know yeah. why I thought yeah. three. That's okay. Sorry. Um, it, so, so that's that's where we are with these two uh, scenarios that are kind of on the table in terms of how to deploy the Parkhurst. Um, and that's really all I have. I have a, I have the schedule we presented a week ago because I know part of. Oh, Chris has his hand up. Chris and Todd. Yep. 
Yeah, you know, I, I was just going to say, I, I think this detail is helpful because, as we said last week, and we need to continue to say, if, if we should proceed with a request at Spring Town meeting, the purpose of it is to advocate for the preferred option. The town needs to understand, you know, we're not putting a gun to their head, that in a, in a way what we're really developing on the right is sort of, you know, what if it fails? The, the right is really plan B, and it's important to know what that is, not just operationally, but what the cost of that is going to be if that's something that needs to get wrapped into the project funding agreement. So I, I think it's really sensible to have both because, you know, inevitably in Winchester, people will ask, well, what happens if this doesn't happen? And this is very helpful because we can actually speak to that. So I, this, this looks good. Right, we have Todd and then John Miller. Todd, just, just looking at this at option B, is there a reason why we can't put the, uh, the modulars um, up and to the right where the play structure is and then move the play structure to the left? And not have to change the the, uh, the the parking area. So I don't think that they would fit where this hill is. Oh, it's a hill. Okay. That yeah. red thing is a hill. I mean, a very conceptual hill, but a hill nonetheless. <laughs> so uh, and it's fairly steep. Um, it is. And so unless we were willing to do some excavation around it, I'm not sure. We could try and see if we could get it to work, but. Um, I am not in one possibility might be to somehow magically angle it, right? We might be able to do that. We're, then then we're, we're certainly that could uh, I mean we'll we'll look at it, Todd. I mean that could conceivably salvage, part, salvage the the loop, although the fact of the matter is it won't allow us to not do supplemental parking, we'll still have some supplemental parking. I mean, it, we could recover, if, if we could manage to push it farther to the plan west, plan east, for, forgive me, to the right, um, we could see maybe, if we could recover the bus loop, we could recover eight spaces. But it doesn't sound like that's gonna be adequate. Um, uh, 30 spaces are not necessarily gonna be adequate. They're apparently completely maxed out now. And so there's no accommodation in this uh, in the existing lot for the, for for additional classrooms. So we probably have with some sort of supplemental parking anyway. We might be able to make it smaller. I think we probably still end up with it. And we'd be happy to look at that option, particularly if this thing um, does end up being the 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 direction. Obviously, we would do a more detailed look, deep dive into the into what we could fit. John Miller had a question. Uh, yes, I was just going to, yeah, could you go to that one? It seems, uh, I think I'm not muted now. Is that correct? Correct. Um, if you go down one slide where you, you or maybe up one slide where you show that the, the new modulars are too, they're too deep, right? They're, they're, they're side by side classrooms. Uh, it seems to me that, that um, you could modify that and get eight eight classrooms in there without being a four by two configuration. Um, they might be two and two off to the north or to the west rather, and, and then three pods of two. So it's kind of, kind of a, 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 a variation on what Todd just said. Um, my kids went to that school when it was Bartlett and it's, it's about a five foot rise. There's a steps, you can see the steps right there in, on this slide in black. It's that those are concrete steps. Um, the field is basically useless. Um, it's, it's in very poor shape. It hasn't been used. It's not much of, it, of, of, of anything really. So it, it seems to me this is worth exploring and it, 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 it might be the preferred option actually, in my mind. Okay. Uh, Chris, do you have another question? Um, I, I didn't realize I still had my hand up. Um, well, so I, uh, I guess my only thought about, so, so as I understand the modulars <clears throat> and, you know, Vivian or Andy or Charlie would better respond to this, that, that these aren't so much designed as they are kind of off the shelf things, right? So I think what we see here are kind of two pods of four, but that I think is actually suggested from the manufacturer. So not sure what sort of flexibility we have and how they get configured, but maybe we do have some, but however they might be arranged, given the fact that there's that grade change that John just described, I just wanted to reiterate the expectation is 
They're all basically coming in at the same finished floor elevation. So we don't create ADA issues with accessible route or, you know, I have to spend more money on a, a, a chairlift or something if you fall off. Um, right. But I mean, we're happy if, if this becomes the direction uh, that, the, that the town pursues, we're happy to look at multiple configurations and see what the most efficient way to do it is within the, within the um, constraints of modular, you know, modular construction, getting them here on the back of a truck, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. And the only other thing I would just add is that the field actually is rented, John, for um, I think it's peewee. Um, in the spring or summer. So it, it does get some use. There have been some school committee meetings where I've got to park two blocks away. Um, I don't know that it generates a great amount of revenue, uh, but I would agree with you. It's in pretty poor shape. It's the worst field in town. <laughs> uh, Don uh, put in a comment. I guess he can't get through on, on the line that uh, at the end of it, it would be a good option to fix that field too. If we are going up there for parking, at least... Uh, make something out of it when we leave. Uh, and, yeah, uh, well, definitively, definitively, if we put temporary parking in there and then remove it, we would absolutely be restoring the field. So at that point, right, there'd be the opportunity to kind of it. reseed it or sod it and, um, and, and, and improve it. Yeah, I, I don't know if you can hear me. Yep, you're on, Don. Oh, okay. good. I'm, I'm Finally, my sound's working. I was okay, just well, trying I'm, to explain for you. Yeah, yeah thank you for, uh, for injecting that. That's all. Uh, just it would be a plus for the town if we did that, you know, uh, right. returned it to a good soccer field that could be used and possibly generate income. I think Frank has a question next. Just, just uh, Charlie, I, I'm wondering about, I know that we don't want to spend more money on modulars if we already have modulars, but I, I do you feel like the existing modulars and trying to work around that building? Because when I look at that, and maybe my scale's off and I'm not really understanding, but the, the existing modulars are two classrooms and I feel like we give up a ton of real estate with that existing building for two classrooms. When I look at what you've outlined for four, for eight classrooms on the top, and I'm just wondering if that existing modular unit was not there, I would assume that, that would, we would be able to bring what you've added to the right more to align with the uh, edge of the existing modular and I'm just wondering whether it's worth, I mean, that that's 20 years old and, you know, it's in decent shape, but um, I'm just wondering whether it's worth looking at that to then potentially stay away from having to do any kind of reconfiguration of the, of the loop. I think uh, we could, again, we could look at all these options. Um, the, the issue becomes it, it, you know, a quarter of a million bucks a classroom or whatever it's going to be. That's a lot of parking lot. Um, we're not expecting to spend that much on reconfiguring the parking lot. So the parking lot reconfiguration may be a less expensive outcome than more modulars. So, now, I have a question. Are you using the existing modules in your calculation at all? We are not because the premise is that it's district admin is using this Parkhurst exactly the same way they are now. If, if in fact, district admin could shrink, then we certainly could use some of those. That would be something somebody would have to tell us. Yeah, we, we, we would have to look to re reconfigure. I and mean, we've, we've got certainly way more space than we need right now in terms of just, it's just a matter of trying to figure out who can be in what space with whom and um, just do some reconfiguring. But presumably at no at no money but which is would make it just a little bit tricky because you can't split those classrooms up with with walls um in any real efficient or effective way but we could certainly look to regroup okay John, so again i think you know a lot of these are nuances and i think all of them actually are great ideas um and all of them we could study i think I think what what this does now with the broadest level is just sort of say this is the kind of um, this is the kind of issues we're going to be facing if this is the option. And I think that we may be able to reconfigure the the modulars somewhat differently. We might be able if 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 district admin could 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 constrict, we might be able to use the existing modular building, which would pick up a couple of classrooms. So I think there's plenty of ways of studying it. Um, we were trying to get a kind of broad brush understanding of what the scope would be. 
And just as an example, one of the classrooms in the module, the existing modular unit is the school committee room. So right. that room sits fairly pretty much empty all day long. It's a, a space that we wouldn't, you know, we could reconfigure and not have it dedicated that way. Uh, John Miller has a question. Yeah, my, my question was, did, did I hear you say that, uh, Charlie, that, um, that the, the, uh, these modular classrooms might be part of the funding agreement with MSBA? The, my, um, the modular classrooms can be part of the project cost, I believe. They're non-reimbursable. Right. So but they the, can be, but the town can vote on them as part of an overall, um, you know, uh, debt vote and debt exclusion vote. In other words, they can be in the project cost. The MSBA would just exclude them. But the fact of the matter is, the MSBA has a cap on site um, construction anyway, which no school in the Commonwealth has ever come under. So all school projects have a, have some portion of their site work excluded anyway, and this would fall under that category. Okay. So, so John, it's just if 100 percent the cost to the of the owner, but it could be in that vote. Okay. Right. I just 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 wanted to make sure that was correct. Yeah, but just to put a finer point on it, even though they only reimburse like eight percent of site costs. As I understand it, it swing space is specifically uh, excluded. So yes. you, you, you're allowed to put it in a pre. You're, you're allowed to borrow the money, you know, for eight modulars that are only there two years, but then you're paying for them for twenty. They'll let you put that in the overall project funding, but they won't give us a dime for it. Which was right. really that was one of the that was really the motivation for putting a million dollars into Parkhurst back in 2010, so we could put some money into a, a, a you know a real estate asset and use it for swing space in lieu of, you know, renting a bunch of modulars somewhere. Do we have any other questions on this? Chris, do you, I mean, uh, Charlie, you have a timeline review? For I have the timeline from a week ago. I okay. just, I saw the agenda talked about uh, timeline next steps relative to, to, um, swing space. So I just brought it back in case do anybody want to refresh their memory. I don't know. Well, that's good. Cause this, this brings on the motion that was made last week also to meet this timeline. Do you want to review it real quick? Well, the timeline was whether or not if the town and the building committee wanted to proceed with the carriage house as an option for swing space, in other words, moving district admin into the carriage house in advance of the Lynch project moving forward so that students could be moved off the Lynch site, not all the students, but some students could be moved off the Lynch site and into the Parkhurst, which was the option A or preferred option on the previous slide. The, uh, the work of the carriage house would have to proceed in advance of the fall town meeting. And what we talked about last week is presumably you would be doing documents for the project in the summer, you'd be bidding it in the fall, you'd be constructing it in late 22 in the first half of 23. So the district could move into it by, you know, the end of school of 2023, which would allow the summer to tra transition students from the Lynch to the Parkhurst. So that's the end game. Um, and then, uh, and then the Parkhurst would be occupied as swing space. And then the Lynch would be proceeding in, you know, in parallel, but behind so that it would start, um, early work in the fall and start the project in earnest January of 2024. And, and, can, and Charlie, can I interject? But the other step of that conversation too was that what drove the the discussion about the article at the last meeting was that because because any work we put into Parkhurst is unreimbursable anyway by the MSBA, we could just as easily roll it into an ask in the spring, and therefore we could cut you guys loose to you know develop a bid package for what's needed at Parkhurst as well, which is much smaller by comparison, but you know, it could be half a million bucks, right? Right. So it gives gives us more sort of confidence with the schedule that the early, I mean, I might call it enabling, but not in the way most people think of it, an early enabling package with respect to swing space is something we have much more control over 
in confidence and have kids out of the out of Lynch by the fall of 23. Uh, John Miller has a question. Yeah, I just I, I hear what you're saying, Chris, but it seems to me that the the least the least uh, 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 variable approach to getting ready for the Lynch construction is what we were just talking about above, where you know where the we have one area to get ready, which is the the, the Parkhurst. We're not worried about construction delays on the carriage house. <laughs> we're not worried about anything. We have one place that we're working on, which is par getting Parkhurst ready to be the swing space. And it seems to me to be less complex and uh, less prone to, 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 to difficulty. So, I mean, well, I, I hear what you're saying, Chris, and I agree with it, but I you know it seems to me that, you know, it is you're juggling three balls now instead yep. of two. Well, this, so this is what in architecture school we call a both and condition. And the beauty of this is we can make progress on both because certainly from kind of a project funding point of view um, and a certainty point of view, rolling, uh, let's say the modulars and the Parkhurst needs into the project funding agreement is something we can totally do. However, that's not going to come to town meeting until the fall. And even if town meeting approves it, so this was the discussion, John, we've had at the last couple of meetings Let's say, well, I, I certainly hope uh, that it, the project funding agreement passes fall town meeting, but we still can't do anything because all that really does is it gives us the green light to go forward with the debt exclusion override. That's a ballot question in mid-January. So maybe early February, TAP A gets to work producing, you know, drawings for Parkhurst and the drawings necessary for modulars. And we would have to obviously get the modulars procured, get the work you know, designed and bid at Parkhurst, and we still got to give teachers um, time to move in. I would defer to Frank on that, but typically we've given, you know, two or three weeks, it would be summertime. So, you know, there's some scheduled constraints to both, but the, the appeal here is we can actually kind of develop two different scenarios. So there may be a preferred option, but there's also, I think, a very, very sensible safety net. I think the only question that I was hearing from TAP A and Hill at the last meeting was whether or not I mean, we may not have great confidence that the modulars, that, that teachers will have moved in in time for school, but we're hopeful that they would at least have been installed by the time for school. So it may get a little bit tight. Um, that's, but yeah, I guess we know more as we sort of move along. But yeah, you know, we, we basically don't green light anything until mid-January. Yes, yeah, sorry. All right. Any other questions on the schedule? Mark has one. Uh, yeah, Jay. Good. Um, so, okay. there are a couple of things that are that are tied up in this that seem like a, a good conversation. First is you know the issue, uh, the question of uh, having an you know an article on the town meeting warrant to discuss the pros and cons of the carriage house and Parkhurst prep in as an option that option A to allow us to use the Parker School as a place, uh, as swing space for the Lynch School. And I think there's some good arguments both ways as to whether that's the right thing to do or not the right thing to do. But if it doesn't, if we don't have the discussion at the Springtown meeting, it, it that is removed as an option. And then we would be in modulars only. That would be, that would be it. The other piece of this that that I feel is somewhat important is that we want to minimize the amount of money that we're just spending on temporary things. Uh, money that we're effectively just, we're, we're not throwing it away because we're using it, but, but it doesn't go to any long-term benefit and modulars would be one of those things where it provides us with swing space, which is great, but we don't get any of that money back. We just spend it and we spend it to put them in, we spend it to take them out. And in the end, we're back where we started, except we spent two to $3 million on modular classrooms to facilitate the construction of Lynch. And it just feels like having the opportunity to discuss the improvement of existing town assets for the long term, in addition to providing benefit to the Lynch project seems like a good good discussion to have. 
I agree. John, do you still have another question? No. All right. Uh, does anyone else have any questions? Hands up. No. All right. Uh, community engagement plan is Vivian, are you taking that? Or is that Charlie? I think that's actually more about Frank, just to maybe share some yeah. thoughts. You know, give, given that we're developing the swing space options, you know, Frank was looking to get some input from the Lynch community or at least sort of begin to explain this. Am I Q? Yes. <laughs> So we will be uh, organizing um, probably some of the same faces that we had in around the visioning work that we had done. We some, we'll get some teachers and some uh, staff to, together, but also we'll have some parents together as well. I uh, was starting that this week. Now that we have, I think, a really kind of a better handle on, on what the options are. I think the, the tough part, and we talked about this earlier today, is helping people understand what the experience will be when they've never had the experience before. So um, in terms of getting kids off the site, the importance of that, um, talking about right now, uh, the idea of eight classrooms um, of, of students, but also helping people to understand kind of what the effect of that is on just daily instruction for the students who remain, and whether there are some preferences from um, parents and staff around what grade levels we would be potentially looking at. And we've I've thrown out there just the idea that, you know, maybe it makes sense for us to look at kindergarten and the lower grades because, for example, kindergarten students would not have been actually at Lynch at the time and we're not removing them from a grade uh, from the school when they've been maybe they're in grade three as an example. So those are really the discussions. I mean, I think it's, um, you know, I, I'm what I'm really interested in hearing is how people are feeling about the grade levels, but also just the the idea of having this a school that will essentially be split. I mean, there's really no other way around it. And <clears throat> whether there's any strong feelings for us to, uh, and not that it's even doable, but um, should we be looking at trying to get more grade uh, classrooms off site, potentially? Um, because I, you know, certainly we we know that the con that construction site would be uh, less complicated if um, if it were completely empty, which is probably not doable, but um, is is there an appetite among parents to to think about more students off site, or is it going to be a challenge just to come up with you know, the two grade levels that we're talking about getting off site? So those discussions will begin uh, shortly from by the end of the week and into next week. Any questions? All right, next is a placeholder for the Waranago that was brought up by Mark last week. It's since been written by uh, Chris Nixon and Meg has shared it with us today, probably about an hour before the meeting or an hour or two. Uh, has everyone had a chance to read that? Okay. No, I haven't. Okay. I'm on my own. And so it's really hard for me to share my screen. Can someone share their screen? No, no, the one about the high school? No, this is um, about the Warren article, just to get it as a placeholder. Okay, all right. No, I haven't seen it. All right. I'll look. Google is not my friend. It's I sent no it out to your email, John, um, around 4.57 tonight. Okay. Sorry. That's okay. So Meg, we need a motion for this to continue and then we'll work together and, and get it, the, all the bugs ironed out of it, I guess. Yeah, I mean, I think that you should make a motion that you would support uh, the article and then what you're supporting and then uh, that you would uh, leave it up to the town management to uh, put it into the proper, you know, legal language for a town meeting. Right. And I kind of just, again, offer a clarification that as it's usually the case with town meeting articles, you start with the article, then you next move on to the motion. It's the motion that actually articulates how much we're looking for and also what the funding source is. So none of that is mentioned in the article which is sort of purposeful because Jay is actually going to be coming to the school committee meeting 
on March 15th to talk about funding sources. And my expectation, uh, having talked with Frank, is that we will have some discussion at the school committee table about rental revenue opportunities coming out of Parkhurst. So there is some concept of um, where the money might come from to cover the debt service, either directly or to offset. But those conversations are coming. Can we get a motion to approve? Well, before we do that, I, I have a problem with the way it's drafted. It's it's really two motions combined. So it's like um, you can't, you, you, you no one's going to be against the second piece of the motion. Um, and I, I worry that this will might cause it actually to fail at town meeting. Um, so it seems to me it's two motions combined in one. And I, I don't, I think that's a mistake. Um, so, so, John, those are together deliberately, given uh, our I know, discussion I, I, at the last couple of meetings. And remember, if it should fail, the modulars are not off the table. Then we pivot to, I mean, we have to go to plan B. So but, but, this is this motion, John, is not about, we should clarify, you see the language at Parkhurst, that has nothing to do with modulars. That's more for any alterations that are necessary to get it ready for kids to move into vacated space. But if this should fail in the spring, then we pivot to plan B, which is all about the modulars, and that would get rolled into the project funding agreement. Yeah, you're, you're making my point for me, Chris. Chris, that's what I'm saying. That, that's why it should be broken into two. Um, th th there's no doubt that the town meeting will unanimously vote the second piece of that motion. I, I can't uh, imagine why anyone wouldn't vote for that. John, I hope, I hope they would not vote the second one. If they don't support the first one, that wouldn't make any sense. Because if the right. first one fails, then Frank and his team aren't going anywhere. And okay. there's no reason to spend any money. So that's yeah. why the committee felt they we, we needed to bundle them together because it's, it's part of a strategy for that preferred option, understanding but, there's a plan B coming in the fall. But it would but that that second piece of the motion would authorize the the school school department and Charlie to go ahead and start planning what what would the configuration be of Parkhurst with or without modulars? So including the parking lot or whatever the, whatever the other things that are being done. So the second piece no. of the motion. No, gives no, the no, well. that, uh, no, that John, that's just the money that's necessary. That would include things like ed tech, you know, any, any work that's been done in Parkhurst to accommodate administration since like 2013 that needs to be sort of undone to get it ready for kids. Imagine if Frank and his team were just gone and we needed to get ready for kids again, just like we did, you know, for the fall of uh, 2011 for VO. What I'm trying to say is that one of the one of the comments that was made was that if we if we don't do something in the spring, we're locked in and locked into modular only. I think that was Mark Scott's position, right? And what I'm yeah. saying is the second half of this might be the solution to that, where the the, the spring. Springtown meeting is not going to futz with that. I mean, the, 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 Lint, this project's going. <laughs> you know, it just seems to me it's fairer and it, it, it's going to, it, it gives you the most flexibility to break this out into two. I think, I think though, I think Chris is, Chris is correct in that if it were broken into two and one had to do with the carriage house and one had to do with Parkhurst, then the only option for Parkhurst would be to add modular classrooms to Parkhurst because the administration would still be there. Oh, but, but if the carriage house passed, then what would happen in the, at the Parkhurst would be different, but you'd already have the approval for it. That's what I'm saying. This gives you the, this is a double, this gives you flexibility. Yeah, yeah, I, mean, I, I see what you're saying. Yeah, um, that, that you could you could have it broken into two parts. Um, it is a little weird. I mean, maybe if the wording of the Parker's school component were vague enough that it allowed for either of those options, that would be a way to do it. That, that's that's that that's the basis for my suggestion. So you don't get trapped. So you're saying, John, to make the second part more flexible such that we're so the, authorizing say, that for the modular yeah, the as well. Right. The carriage house passes. What Charlie does is different. The design, the getting Parkhurst ready is different. That's a different assignment now. 
the carriage house fails, <laughs> the, 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 you already have authority to go ahead and, and reconfigure and, and, and come back so, so that you don't lose that time. <laughs> but, you know, whatever. I, I, I missed last meeting. It's fine. I, if you want to keep going, it's fine. Was there wording we could put into the first one? So what we want is the first part to swing to either option so it doesn't fail automatically. Correct. If the carriage, right. If the carriage house fails, we still want to be able for Chowie to proceed. Correct. And that can't happen the way it's written right now. Correct. So we split it into two. Is that the idea? So one is the carriage house and one is to, in either of those cases, proceed with the funding for the Parkers? Right. So I think I think the wording could be adjusted a little bit so that you end up with Charlie's authorized to go in either case. Right. Or you could have two articles and the second article would be indefinitely postponed if the first article passed. So, you know what I mean, John? So yeah. if, you know, but that, again, I'd have to really work on the wording for that. Um, and to see what the appetite was for something like that. Um, but then, so, Meg, if, if we did that, if, if the second article was automatically postponed, if the first one failed, then it, 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 and I, no, I, I guess, saying, then, no, go ahead. If the first one included both, but it failed, then if that, if article one, fa oh, your motion, first motion failed, then you could move uh, to the second one. But if the first one passed, then you would just indefinitely postpone. The, and the second motion would strictly be just the Parkhurst work. Correct. Yeah. I mean, the thing I like, I, I, I think, I think John's solution is is nice in that it it separates the two issues. But I also see the value in the combined motion or combined articles simply because that that's really the intent of the request for carriage house and Parkhurst is to do these two sequential things as one thing, um, and it's kind of nice to see them as one thing together, but but I also understand the complexity of, of either breaking it, of keeping it together and adding a second motion versus just splitting them in two. So. It, it all, what I guess what I'm suggesting is you could change the, the, the language after the word and so that it says that there's a, there's a double-edged future path <laughs> it, that Cap A is going to design for either for e, for Parkhurst as the swing space, irrespective of whether the first piece passes or not. Do you, you know what I'm saying? So, yeah. so the, yeah. yeah, that's all. Whether that's the modulars or whether that's um, minor renovations to the existing Parkhurst classrooms. Yeah. Uh, building off Mark's comment, though, and which is completely absent, which is implied by connecting the two, and which is kind of the point we need to convey is that there's two to $3 million that need to be spent somehow accommodating displaced lynch kids for this project. And I think there's a, a, a thought that spending that money on in a way that it's going to have future value, both residual value and possibly even revenue generating value is better than spending it on modulars that get carted away. And that's obviously sort of implied by connecting the two. It's a complicated point we're trying to make. We're, we're trying to ultimately say there's two to $3 million that could be spent one way, in which case at the end of the day, we're left with nothing. And in another way, we're left with assets that have value to the town for other purposes. But how do we simplify that? So Brian, uh, when, when you prepare uh, an article for town meeting, it consists of three parts. There's the article, there's the motion, and then there's the background. So the background is where you have the opportunity to tell your story. And it's not anything that gets voted on. The language is never, you know, not verbatim repeated or anything. It's just your chance to, you know, tell your story. So that's can where you a, do that. Can I make a suggestion? I've been noodling on what John is suggesting. I wonder what John thinks about this idea. What if we leave the article just as it is, as everybody sees it, and we call that article one with the understanding it comes before article two. So there's the opportunity to make the presentation to town meeting, to Brian's point, the pros and cons investment versus, you know, basically throw away money. 
if Article 1 fails, then we would move to Article 2. And John, Article 2 could be what you're looking at now, everything after the word and. So in other words, the first proposal is Carriage House and Parkhurst. And if that were to fail, then we could go to a second question, which is money for construction, alterations, et cetera, at Parkhurst. Does that make sense? Yeah, I, I think you could wrap it up. And I, I, I yeah, it, it makes sense yeah. to me. I, I just think a little bit of wordsmithing and then we, we, we avoid all the problems that that gap that you were worried about, that six months gap where yeah, yeah. If, if the carriage house yeah. fails, then we're kind of stuck. Right. So, so this, if, if we leave it the way it is, I mean, generally, because of course, we, you know, Meg and Mark are going to want to work with council on this a little bit. If we basically vote what we have in front of us tonight, that gives us the opportunity to kind of pitch this, as Mark Scott said, this is the preferred option and here's why. If that should fail, we want to fail in the spring, not in the fall, but then we could pivot to a follow-up question and it would basically, okay, we would say, okay, if not this, what about this? And, and that could be easy, Meg, because what we could decide tonight is to submit the article as presented and in addition, a second article to follow with the same language that we currently see everything after the word and. It, it basically just describes all the Parkhurst work alone, if that makes sense. And now we have two options. Could, could I suggest that we that we table this and, and 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 come up with that language and vote it at once next week? We don't. We, we don't. Can't, have, uh, we need the uh, the article language by Friday. Yeah, we got to vote it tonight. Um. Well, I mean. So, okay. Uh, I, I, so the language we don't need to vote the language tonight. Uh, I don't we think just so. look. Yeah, look for you to vote the sort of. <laughs> you know the intent and then we the town would draft the language um so i mean only just because you are out of time unless you want to meet again later this week to vote it uh, being out of time is not has not ever been persuasive to me but yeah, I'm sorry. I don't know what to say other than that. That's the dead, you know, Friday is the deadline. So, <clears throat> um, so it's up to the committee. I mean, I would uh, go ahead, Tom. I'm just not comfortable, uh, Chris, saying, hey, we're going to vote something now and then we're going to add something later. Uh, and the deadline is Friday. How are we going to do that? I mean, I, I'd be comfortable saying, hey, let's let's ask Meg to, to modify the language after the word and so that it it's apparent that there's two possible paths and that the, that we're authorizing either of those paths. That, and then that could be, then we could describe what we're talking about in the description. And then we've solved both problems. And, you know, however you feel about the carriage house, it, this is not going to disrupt us. Lynch is yeah, going to go. I, I, I'm just not sure how we create two paths with one article or one motion, John. Um, right. I, I guess I, I, I was told you for that. I just told you how to do it. Uh, just, yeah, I'm, having, I'm, having, I'm having trouble visualizing it. The language reads something like, and for the design, construction, and alteration of the Parkhurst School for use as temporary educational swing space, blah, blah, blah. And then, say, but before, after the word project in the third to last line, in in either scenario, in in the in two alternatives, one where the park where the carriage house is being reconstructed, and the second one where it isn't. Close parentheses, including all costs incidental or related thereto. And then, so that <laughs> might be John, that might be adding like a comma, in, including but not limited to modular classrooms. And so now, now, so now we're picking up, you know, it could be construction alterations. It could be modular classrooms. It could sort of be whatever it needs to be. Right. I think that still needs to be two articles, though, because if it mentions the carriage house and the town votes the carriage house part of the proposal down, I don't think there's a way to partly approve an article, right? I agree. Yeah, it, it's, it, it would be approving... They would be voting on the motion, which would be for both parts of the article. So, I mean. Then we just break it out into part one and part two. I think it needs to be two, 
two separate articles and then article yeah i think it should be i would make it two separate articles i know what, sorry my i have a puppy um i know what brian and mark are trying to say that it's really important to connect the two um you could have the first article could have both in it uh to make the point and then the second article could just be the Parkhurst piece that would be indefinitely postponed and not voted on would even be considered if article if the first article passed I, I well, like I think that I think that's very clean so it's like it, it's either it's if this and if not this then it's that okay. two, yeah, exactly. two bite two bite the apple there's a big bite and a little bite and if you're comfortable Meg with you know what what Brian and Mark and John are saying then I'm comfortable with you taking, you know, the language we have currently for Parkhurst and, you know, making some alterations for that second article. Again, this is to get something in to meet the deadline for the warrant, but it'll certainly come back and get massaged and wordsmithed, right? Yeah, and don't forget, you have the opportunity to, uh, you you need to draft and vote the motion, and that's the most important piece. Yeah. Um, so that gets into more detail, um, specifically about okay. what it is you're funding. Are you yeah. only funding design? Are you funding design and construction? Yeah. Are you funding, you know. It, it How much time seem... do we have, Meg, before we have to vote the motion? Um, I don't remember exactly, but I want to say like April 8th. So right, not so much have, time, but enough. We have time to wordsmith this correctly. Yeah. yeah. So we need a motion tonight for submitting two options. Uh, Two articles to be independent yeah, one, articles. One, one, one as presented, and a second one. You know, we, we, I, I would recommend Jay. We just defer to you as chair to work with Meg to to develop that language that covers the Parker scope as a standalone article. I think that will no, help with the I background can't. portion as well of the article because the article two would be able to go into detail just about adding modulars to Parkhurst and how it could be done and what the potential, you know, impacts might be. And then the first one would be carriage house Parkhurst Lynch into yep. Parkhurst. And it's pretty clean that way. And then all of the supporting documentation would be there. Yeah. Like everything we need to talk about would be there. Yeah, I, I think I'm, it's I'm, really I'm fine with that. I, I second that motion. If it's okay. a motion, Chris, to like let Jay do that. I, I think the, but the second, the second article should also explain that it, it could also fit into the same schedule. Yeah, agree. yeah it, it fits into John, the same totally schedule. Agree. I think that's a great idea. Yeah, uh, yeah. It, yeah it, it's the most like democratically transparent. It's it's nice, but it, I think it's really clear that it's like we're presenting as option A or option B to accommodate the Lynch displacement. You got to pick one if Lynch is going to happen. And, and the good news about that. that. The good news about timeline is, you know, once the article language is perfected, then you work on the motion, and then actually, then the last thing you do is you work on the background, and then of course, then separately, we would put an actual presentation together. So there's there's some time to get to the background piece as well. Yeah, although so, that will be due the same time the motion is, because then the motion book goes out. So and we need okay. to have everything all together. You don't need to have your presentation done because this won't be until. The earliest, you know, May 5th or whatever that first Monday in okay. May is. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think you'll want to spend the next couple of meetings maybe, you know, working on the length and, and what so, you want to put in the background, et cetera. So you're telling me Mark Tugood's just being a nice guy when he always gives me an extra week for background language, Meg? Uh, yeah. <laughs> okay. So do you want a motion, Jay, or do you got one? You have one. Uh, Chris, is that a motion from you? Yeah, I'm, I made the motion. I don't okay, know if John seconded. Miller seconded. So the roll call, Mark Scott? Aye. Brian? Aye. Frank? Aye. Chris? Yes. Uh, Colleen? Aye. John? Aye. Good. Uh, John Miller, yes. John? Aye. Lisa? Yeah. And John? John? Aye. Okay. Thank you. Okay, so that passed. And we'll work on that in the next few weeks. 
Meg, let me know whatever you need for me to help out and get that if going. If I can help you too, Megan, let me know. I yeah, that'd be hot. Yeah, help, John. Yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, I might just want to get, uh, yeah, have some of you just look at the language that I'm going to submit to Mark and Beth by Friday, just so we're clear that I got it straight. Perfect. I'm happy to help. I'm also happy to help draft the background if that's, if someone wants. I'm happy to do that. When's the due date for that? Is that also Friday? I will get you dates on that. Okay. No, it's not this Friday. No, you have yeah, you have a, like you have a while, a while to to do that. All right. Just remind people again, um, Jay is going to grace us with his presence on uh, the what is it, fifteenth, right? March fifteenth, yes, Tuesday. So he'll he'll come with Charlie and present all this to the school committee and have kind of similar conversation. The difference there is we're going to get really serious about you know, sources of revenue to offset this if the preferred option should pass. So EFPBC members certainly welcome to come. We, we do meet in person at Parkhurst, although the meetings are broadcast over WinCam. Okay. Uh, Meg has a, a letter, a uh, town management letter for tonight. And we have uh, Tape Architects invoice for 59958 and Hill International for 18155 and that is it. So can I get a motion? Can I move to authorize payment on the Hill and Tape invoices as presented, Jay? Yes, second. Second. Thank you, Brian. All right, Mark? Aye. Frank? Aye. Colleen? Aye. Don? Aye. John Miller? Yes. Todd? Todd? Waiting on Todd. Lisa? Yes. And John? Yes. All right, Todd, are you there? Sorry, I... Okay, thank you. So passed. I'll get that over to you tonight, Meg. And next is, um, so other business. Uh, there was a letter sent out uh, today um, from Beth. I don't know if everyone's had a chance to see it or not or comment. Uh, these are all items that were brought up last week at the uh, select board meeting after our meeting. And I guess uh, there's statements or guidelines. So I just want to make sure everyone, everyone has seen it. I don't think we actually can comment on it, but it was sent out. And I just want to make sure everyone has received it. Mm -hmm. Jay, I would just offer with respect to some of those goals at Lynch, um, those were all goals. I think Charlie did a good job at the presentation that you and I attended. I guess the month before um, we talk about EUI targets. I think we were pretty clear that that's a baseline expectation yep. for the Everett source participation. So, you know, what they voted is essentially what we've already said we're committed to on the project. Right. I agree. Yep. Okay. Uh, next meeting dates, March 14th. We'll have the PSR and hopefully feedback from MSBA. And on the 21st, uh, we'll, we'll have the FAS status and the DS, DESE feedback. Anything else to expect on those meetings? All right, Jay, I just think we should probably plan on keeping those dates, you know, as placeholders and given how things are evolving, especially with the warrant and everything. But if there's the potential that we drop a meeting, you know, you'll certainly let people know, right? Right. Right, and uh, it's all pending on MSBA's feedback also, so. Okay. Jay, I just want to very quickly just, um, I'd like to send an email out to the Sustainability Subcommittee for us to get another meeting in the books in the next two or three weeks. So just look for that. Great. Thank you, Colleen. Anything else for tonight? Okay, get a motion to close. So moved. Second? Second. Todd, okay. Mark? Aye. Brian? Aye. 
Frank? Aye. Colleen? Aye. Don? Aye. There. Aye. John Miller? Yep. Lisa? Yes. And John? Aye. Thank you very much. Thanks, guys. Have a Thank good you. night, guys. Have a good night. Thank good you. Night, everybody. Everybody. Thank you.